you know, I think anyone listening to this podcast, if you have kind of an entrepreneurial mindset, you're, you've probably had that experience where you have an idea and it's like, this idea is amazing. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to build it. And you can kind of take that too far and basically be con- convince yourself that this idea is going to work even when you start getting feedback from the market that it doesn't look like a good fit. And so being willing to move quickly from one idea to the next and not be too sold on even your own ideas um, as as an entrepreneur, I think it's very important. Tyler single-handedly built a software company, co-founded a few direct-to-consumer dietary supplement companies, started a VC-backed fintech, an early Bitcoin adopter, father of two beautiful girls, and is regularly called the smartest person that I know. Yo, 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 welcome to the Find Your Freedom podcast, Tyler. Hey guys, thanks for having me. What's up, Tyler? How you feeling? Feeling good today. How about you guys? We're great. Happy to have you here. Let's jump right in. Tyler, Tyler, you've been an entrepreneur for a long time now, uh, but I worked. I know that you worked at a corporation right out of college. How do you feel that that experience impacted you? Um, I think it was extremely valuable. I think working for a company and kind of seeing how it works um, from the employee side, you know, if you have plans to be an entrepreneur, that knowing the experience of an employee and, you know, how you want to be treated and kind of that employee to boss relationship um, you know, is something very valuable to have from the employee side before you go into, uh, you know, starting your own business. Yeah, I think that same thing. I I obviously had a lot much longer employment on the corporate side. um, But I think um, you and I have had that conversation multiple times just over the years managing our own employees, how because of going through that experience, you can really see like, I really don't want to be like that. Or, wow, I really feel like this was super valuable thing to be more formalized uh, and some things to be a little looser on. So, so I totally agree with you on that. What do you think your biggest lesson that you pulled from that early corporate life was? Um, I think it just kind of gave me a sense that even with a, you know, bigger company that it was still just kind of finding the right idea and getting kind of people behind a vision and that there wasn't really, I guess, anything magic about a company. It's just a lot of people doing their part and kind of working towards one goal. Um, and that it was just made me feel like, Hey, I, I think I could come up with an idea at some point and, you know, get the right people on board to, to build something myself. So do you think when you were at that corporation, were you already in the mindset that this isn't going to be me for a while? Like I really, am going to start my own thing. Was that, was that part of what your thought process was? You were just kind of buying time until the million dollar yeah, came I, I Absolutely. I think I had always just kind of had this vision in my head that I would start something. Um, and being kind of a programmer background, I had, I had been doing a lot even, you know, in high school with just ideas and projects. And so it, it just seemed like it was kind of finding the right time and getting the experience and uh, education first. Yeah, I don't... Um consider myself to be much of a computer tech savvy uh, person. And, you know, Jonathan can attest to that. Oh yeah. Second um, that for sure. I, <laughs> we, we know uh, you are a, a, a rock star programmer and um, you know, that, that's in our today's economy, one of the, the probably the most marketable skills. Um, therefore a lot of folks, young folks coming out of college with that, uh, that skill set and that background, you know, they kind of have their pick of the litter in terms of um, high paying, lucrative entry level jobs for, um, you know, in that in that industry. So you said that you kind of worked the corporate gig a little bit and kind of started down that path. And then you took that hard right turn and, you know, went down the entrepreneurial path instead. So what what kind of what led you to 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 take that turn and and kind of take the the road less traveled there? Well, I think, you know, especially 10 years ago, there really wasn't the big paychecks for working at uh, a big company. You know, I think the big companies were starting to establish themselves and, you know, but, but out of school, I think I was making about $12 an hour, which wasn't bad, but no one was offering, you know, hundreds of thousands in stock options, at least here in Utah. 
And so, so, so I, I guess it wasn't was, that uh, lucrative. Yeah, it <laughs> or maybe it was a little bit different it was, time it was back good. then. I enjoyed it, but uh, it definitely felt like you know building something myself. I felt like you know would be at least worth the uh, the shot and to take that risk. What age were you when you made that choice? Um, I think I was. Let's see, I must have been about twenty eight. And okay. so, yeah, I was, was still in school. Was you know kind of on the slow path through college and uh, had, had just been doing a lot of projects and programming, had worked for some web web development companies. And it was actually while I was kind of at uh, a, a company with a, a, a decent job that I, I just kind of decided to leave that. And now was the time to, to kind of make that leap and, and take the risk. And so, yeah, I, I quit that job before uh, before we really had anything launched for our supplement company. Can you go into your uh, sort of your background in programming a little bit? Did you take classes at college for that? Was that something you picked up early in your life? No, I, it was something I got into early. Um, you know, our dad had a home computer, you know, I guess it was probably for work. And that was in elementary school. I think I was in second grade. And other friends, you know, that if they had a home computer, you know, it was no way the kids could touch it. They were way too expensive. And it was just a DOS computer. There was a, really wasn't games or anything for kids to do on it. But uh, me and Travis just loved playing on it. Our dad, you know, let us do that. And, uh, you know, I really credit him for building that kind of early interest in computers by letting us explore on kind of the expensive home computer. And so one of the few things that you could do in a, a stock DOS operating system, it had a, a programming language called QBasic with some sample programs and just a help file. You know, there was no internet. And so we would just play around making our own little programs and trying to figure out how those sample games worked. And uh, just, yeah, we just loved spending hours playing on it. So that was the early years. And then how did it transition to where you're now just be able to write your own complete software, both internal and external? Um, I just always was kind of looking for like what else was out there in, in terms of computers and, you know, coming into high school, the internet was just really taking off in the early nineties. And so, you know, I just started learning Perl and doing small projects for friends and family. And that's when I kind of started doing my own small, small projects and websites and just kind of throwing, throwing ideas out there. You know, those early stages of just having an idea and programming that were just so fun that, you know, I, I just do that over and over and, you know, see what I could build. Isn't it amazing how some people just have that capability to push themselves and go learn things that are super hard and, and just be really self-taught. I just don't feel like I had that going through. Doug, did you have that where you would just like go like, become an expert in something without anyone really pushing you just like self not at all motivation. <laughs> <laughs> not at all i'm trying to think as you're setting up the question there um you know i i think one of the things from that tyler's uh what i'm hear, hearing from tyler you know is the the old saying um do what you love and you never have to work a day in your life and sound like sounds like you really loved messing with computers and seemed like it was almost like kind of a game to you where, you know, like, you know, I know you like to play video games as well, but like, you know, the same way that kids can jump on their Xbox for hours and hours and hours every day, you were kind of that way with computers. And then it turns into something that's, again, like we said earlier, kind of a very lucrative skill that leads to success in business. Yeah, definitely. I feel like, you know, I could have had many, you know, any other hobby and it might have not have been something that turned out to be kind of the next big industry. And so there was definitely, I think, a degree of luck that what just really, uh, you know, drew me in and was an interest to me, you know, happened to be something that was a valuable skill. Luck that you became an absolute expert in the best skill set that you could possibly <laughs> have. A <laughs> little bit of luck in there. I love that. Was that something that you were doing a lot of? Um, you said that was kind of when your father brought the computer home uh, in the early days of, of the internet and um, uh, you were kind of in high school and then in college, w what was that like for you? Were you in your dorm room and in your apartment uh, during college kind of tinkering away and learning all the new programs that were coming out? 
Yeah, college uh, definitely kept uh, going down that path, started taking some computer science and information system classes, um, kind of looking for something that could, you know, really push me and, you know, teach me something, something new. Um, it was also amazing because Provo, next to BYU, you know, the city where BYU is, um, had Google Fiber, one of the early Google Fiber cities. Um, it was just Provo Fiber first through the city and then Google acquired it. But, uh, you know, having one gigabit speed internet, you know, I could host a server from my, my apartment and, you know, it was faster than a lot of, um, you know, commercial internet connections at the time, you know, have a one gigabit connection was awesome. So, you know, I set up a server, a web server in my apartment and would just host all my own projects and friends and family's projects off that, uh, that internet connection. All right. So, so, so partly off that college thing, uh, I think there's always been a debate on how valuable college is. And it seems like it really is a pretty, pretty even mix of entrepreneurs who derive value from it. Uh, where are you on that scale of how important it was for you? And if you think it's worthwhile for entrepreneurs to go to, um, I think, and it's, I think it's been said a lot that the connections you make at school are probably the, you know, the most valuable thing, just the relationships and friendships. And those are the same people that I've, you know, partnered with on different projects throughout, you know, the last 20 years. But I do think that it can be an easy trap that kind of the school, the you know college experience is going to teach you everything you need to know. But it seemed like it was people that were tinkering and building and learning outside of school that really, you know, came away prepared or, or you know, really ahead and, and ready to, to do their own thing. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point I hadn't really thought about before is, you know, some people say, you know, maybe the, the college you choose doesn't matter too much. But I think, you know, it does kind of matter based on the quality of the network that you're able to build. So I know a lot of these people that go to the really top schools, um, you know, the, the relationships they build during that period, like you said, those are the ones they start the companies with. So if you're at a school that's not having the top people, potentially that could be impactful. So that's a really good point I hadn't thought about before. Yeah, yeah John, I would really. say you're kind of unique in that, you know, a lot of people I feel like either meet their business partner during college or meet their business partner post-college in their the early part of their career. And your business partners are from high school. I think that's really, um, that's probably pretty rare, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, Cause yeah, yeah, I think um, for me, uh, my, my um, network did start building during college. Tyler, I don't know if you knew, know about my whole um, painting business that I did during college, but it was bit. called college works painting. And uh, where it, you know, if I hadn't gone to college, that opportunity wouldn't have been available to me. And, um, you know, and doing that internship, learn some good skills. And then after doing the internship, uh, you know, a few years went by trying to figure out, you know, what my next move was going to be in my mid 20s. And, um, you know, I ended up getting a job opportunity through the one of the general partners of the college internship company that I worked for. And again, it kind of goes back to, you know, that opportunity that I had at college. So, so yeah, the, I think the network, the network that you build and, and the opportunities that you have just from being in college, not specifically the degree, not specifically the, you know, the, the courses that you're taking necessarily, but yeah, the network and the people that uh, you get to meet and get exposed to. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So you said your dad uh, sort of brought home computers for his company. So I, I think uh, um, he's an entrepreneur. Can you expand a little bit on what uh, his impact as, as an entrepreneur had on you and uh, sort of some lessons you feel that you learned from that? Yeah, I think uh, I definitely saw the example of my dad. You know, he started a company out of college as a contractor, just doing low voltage, you know, fire alarm systems. We'd go out to job sites, you know, in the summers in high school and pull wire. But just kind of seeing that example of my dad as kind of the you know, the founder of the company and the leader and directing employees, you know, just going to his office and kind of being in his office and, and kind of, I don't know, just the feeling of being there was something that was like, yeah, this is something that I want to do. And so I think he was extremely influential and in, in kind of instilling that that at least was an option, you know, to consider. Yeah, I think that um, I think that 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 definitely is true because my dad was corporate um, growing up. He worked for NASA, so he would wake up early and drive in 
to the office, work all day and then come home. And maybe that's where I got programmed also because it, through college, I never thought about the entre- entrepreneurship either. And it was you guys that really kind of pulled the veil out for me to, to let me see behind the curtain and say like, oh, there is a life outside of long hours working for other people, um, not having the freedom to, to, to do in my life as I was hoping to um, spend time with my children and things like that. Uh, so I can see how impactful that was your dad, basically like he started the company, he runs the company and you're seeing that he's coming, going, I know your dad was obviously a really hard worker, um, but you saw that there was more freedom with that. So I can see how impactful that would be. Yeah, but definitely he instilled that kind of, I guess that the worth ethic that, you know, he'd wake up early to beat traffic, to commute down to LA where his business was and just, you know, day in, day out that, you know, you saw when things were harder for him or he had frustrations or, you know, things still weren't going well financially, even as a business owner. And I think it kind of gave that bigger picture that, you know, it's not all roses. You know, I think a lot of people that want to start something, it's, Hey, I'm going to launch this. It's going to blow up. And, you know, everything's kind of be going to be amazing. And, you know, I think just growing up my whole life, it it was to see the whole picture that it is a process and you have ups and downs and, you know, where he kind of built his business to, you know, took kind of his whole life. Yeah. On that note, um, you know, you talked about some of the hardships that he kind of went through and navigated as a business owner. Um, on this podcast, we like to kind of highlight that part of the the process, that part of the journey um, to show folks, you know, it isn't, you know, we, we're working towards freedom. We're working towards having all the nice things that come along with running your own business and being in business for yourself. But we also like to highlight and talk about, you know, some of the most difficult parts of the journey as you're getting started and what, what you have to overcome and, and all those adversities. Can you talk to us and our audience a little bit about some of those things that you remember, maybe the most difficult uh, adversity that, that you faced as a, as a young business owner? Uh, some of my adversities or my father's? Yeah. Yours, yours. Yeah, I think beside, you know, before starting Supergenx with Travis and uh, Jonathan, I just, was always creating things. And I guess I never really felt like a big investment, whether it succeeded or failed. I obviously wanted it to, to do well, but I think that's where I think I started developing kind of the feeling that you can have an idea and whether it works or it doesn't just kind of seems more to how the market receives it. And I liked creating and, you know, the early stages of programming. And so I was kind of fine if something didn't go well to just, drop that project and, you know, I'll come up with something else. And so, you know, I probably had dozens of, of projects and websites that ended up not working out. I, you know, I think it made it easier that I was, you know, either in high school or college, I didn't have, you know, family and I, I wasn't trying to create income at the time. And so I, I guess I probably didn't feel like they were failures where it's like, hey, if this doesn't succeed, I'm going to have to, you know, find a, another job. And that, uh, I think, just gave me, you know, time to keep exploring and building. But, you know, those those were failures. And, you know, I learned something from each of those projects that, you know, I, I did something differently in the next one. And I think all those lessons, you know, kind of brought me to um, be ready for that first success, you know, that really blew up. Yeah, I think that's such an important point that a lot of people miss is sometimes getting the product, getting the idea to market and letting the market tell you if it's a good idea pretty quickly is really critical and can save people a lot of time and money. Um, I know just from our you know extended relationship, I've always admired how much you've put time into starting a bunch of different things and uh, you know a decent number of them don't work out, but you have a lot of them that you've learned a bunch of things through and then the work you put into some of the ideas that didn't work out actually transitioned into be beneficial for some of the other companies that did work out. So I think that's really admirable. Yeah. Even when we started super gen X, you know, me and Travis had the first product in mind um, that we wanted to do, but you know, we had the conversation that, you know, we'll probably need to do 10 products before we find one that works. (laughs) So let's, you know, start with number one and, you know, see if, anyone's interested in that. If not, you know, we're going to move on to the next one. Fortunately, you know, the, the first one blew up, but, and so that kind of might look like, you know, the first, the first uh, attempt was a success, but, you know, I would really say that all of the other projects outside of supplements, you know, were my failures that, uh, you know, kind of got me ready and 
for this, you know, for this success. Well, yeah. And, and before that first product blew up, you'd already written, you know, tens, if not hundreds of websites, you'd already built, you know, databases for a bunch of other things. So, um, so you had a lot of the tools to, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, talk a little bit more about some of the things I admire about you. So Tyler built the entire software infrastructure for this first product that he's talking about. So he built the website for it and then he built the entire back end. So the customer service end, taking the phone calls, tracking the orders, fulfilling the orders is all built into his front end, back end system that Tyler wrote all on his own. And as the company grew and as the, um, the company got more complex, Tyler just built more and more, you know, uh, different pieces onto it. And it, and it, it turned out to be this really, you know, beautiful software fulfillment, customer service, um, all in one that we actually had other companies, um, reaching out to us, uh, to utilize. And, um, you know, it's, it's just really remarkable how, you know, how smart you are and how hardworking you are to be able to b- build all those things. Um, so, so I think it's important for the, for the audience to know how, you know, how detailed you are and how um, high end of a programmer you are and why, um, it's not irregular for you to be told that you're the smartest person that people know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, and, you know, I think that kind of uh, stemmed from, you know, when I was working um, for the marketing company as a, a developer and just seeing their customer support reps or their staff switching between, you know, a dozen systems when they're handling customer service issues or problems. And, you know, so that kind of created this vision. Hey, when I start something, I want, you know, I think we can get a lot of efficiency if we build everything ourselves. And, you know, everything is just streamlined for every process, whether it's, you know, taking a phone call or shipping an order. And, you know, I think we we made the company, you know, 10 times more efficient than if we had kind of piecemeal put together, you know, uh, products that, you know, we could have found out there. I know what you mean. My my company uses like five different uh, platforms. <laughs> <laughs> As you're saying that, I'm thinking about all the ones that we're switching between all my tabs and. Yeah, it'd be nice to have an all-in-one <laughs> solution platform that we could do all of ours in. So maybe we could talk about that a little bit more later. Yeah, you got to go find go find you a Tyler to, get to put find all, you a all Tyler. those together. Find you a Tyler. All right. Yeah, I had the find same the thing time. with all my with all my hospitality background. It's just like, yeah, you got ten programs. You're having toggle back and forth in between, which is why I think when we were in, um, you know, in the middle of the thick of it, as we were sort of growing the company. I don't think we all fully appreciated like how lucky we were to be building all this on top of the software, which ended up being its own entity and it's in, in its own. Um, and then now looking back on it, um, you know, now that we're 12 years deep on, um, on that specific dietary supplement company. And I'm looking at Tyler with a bunch of his peers who are also super successful programmers with some, you know, top 100 companies. Um, and watching them work on some other projects out, outside of, um, uh, you know, the companies that we built. And it's just being able to see like really how um, the programming that that he does is able to, you know, I, I don't have a program background. So and I think most of the audience probably doesn't. So to be able to see really how diverse and, um, you know, the ideas are able to, to really transition to a lot of different projects. And that kind of transitions us into the next pro- uh, question I had, which is blockchain. I know you've been digging a lot into blockchain, Tyler. Can you tell us a little bit about what you see for the future of blockchain? Yeah, I've been spending a lot of time, uh, you know, almost since the beginning of Bitcoin, just kind of following along and, you know, learning about it. That was just another really interesting technology. And I think in the next few years, I'm kind of most interested in just following the developments in DeFi. You know, that's where I think a lot of the, you know, person to person transactions are happening. And, um, you know, we saw the the biggest kind of explosion in that space um, in the last two years before this bubble deflated. And so I think what kind of emerges um, from this downturn in DeFi will be will be really interesting. You know, I think people are trying to figure out what, um, you know, kind of what are these new primitives of finance that DeFi will create. And, you know, we have these decentralized um, exchanges now where I can, you know, 
sell Bitcoin for dollars and there's no third party, there's no bank taking a cut of those fees. And the person on the other side of the trade um, is just another person and they make those fees directly. And so it's really removing that kind of friction and the middleman in in uh, in costs. So for the consumer, for me as you know, the person making the trade, the fees will be less. And for you as the provider of capital, you know, you're going to make those fees instead of the bank making those fees and giving you, you know, a small percentage of those back. Um, but the big kind of questions that remain to be seen is, are there going to be new yields or returns in DeFi? Um, I think this first wave of DeFi, people were kind of thinking there was new magical yield and, and kind of money or returns would come from nothing or at low risk. But uh, it, it kind of seems like the the real yields of DeFi are going to be from the same thing we see in traditional finance, exchanging, you know, swapping tokens, um, basically like the stock market and uh, lending. And, you know, those are the same big, you know, fee fee makers as traditional finance. And so, I, you know, I kind of hope and am interested to see what, what new things will emerge. But, at, you know, at the least, um, you know, we should see the benefits of, of that person to person and removing the, the banks as a middleman. So through all that tech, uh, it sounds like you're still pretty bullish on it. Is it, it do you feel like it's going to overtake traditional finance? I think it will take a while. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that still need to be answered and people are, are looking for solutions. But, you know, people need loans for their home. And if that could be done on the blockchain, that would be amazing. But, you know, what happens when someone's upside down and, you know, you need to have an interaction in the real world to, uh, you know, if someone is foreclosed on their home with a blockchain loan, you know, how, how does that whole process work? How is it decentralized? How is it trustless? Is that even possible? And so if there aren't good solutions or it's not a good fit for, for blockchain and DeFi, then, you know, we might not ever see, you know, banks go away for some of those traditional sources of financing real world assets like vehicles and homes. Super interesting. Uh, can we pull back a little bit? Maybe some of the audience doesn't fully understand even what blockchain is. Uh, can you kind of try and try and describe it for people? Yeah, I think uh, if anyone's ever had an account, you know, Venmo is really popular, or PayPal, um, or even your bank account. They control your deposit. Once you put your money in, you need to request permission to get it out. And most people have never had a problem with that. But uh, you know. It used to be common that PayPal would lock people's account early on saying, hey, we're not sure what's going on here. We're going to hold your money for six months. There's no appeals process. There's no bigger banking authority to go to. You just need to wait until we figure this out and we're just going to hold all your money. And so that kind of rubbed people the wrong way. And people were looking for solutions to say, how can we always be in control of our own money and basically have a digital cash. You know, if cash is in my wallet, I can spend it whenever I want and no one can stop me from handing you, you know, cash to make a transaction, you know, in but just just between you and me. And so there was uh, you know, several evolutions and people playing with different pieces, but it wasn't until Bitcoin with the anonymous founder Satoshi Nakamoto that put all the pieces together and really created the first comprehensive system that allowed value transfer, you know, send payments between people with no third party like a bank that has any oversight in that transaction. And so no one can ever freeze the funds I'm holding. And that just opens up a whole new kind of world of finance where things can, you know, payments can be made without without permission of a government or a bank. That's awesome. Sounds like a lot of freedom. We like that freedom word out here. Um, so I, I know you've been with Bitcoin basically from the beginning. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, uh, tell us if there's any Bitcoin killers left out there that you think. I think Bitcoin's it's reaching an interesting tipping point where it doesn't look like any big uh, developments will be made in Bitcoin. Um, that's kind of posed as a, a feature right now that Bitcoin is very stable. It's, you know, when you don't add new features, that means you're also not going to add any new bugs unintentionally. But at the same time, there's so many projects iterating and trying to improve in the space that it does feel that Bitcoin um, could start losing more of its uh, kind of dominance. 
um, to the, especially to the smart chains, which in addition to, you know, sending payments to each other opens up, you know, a whole new world of, of smart programs and smart money that uh, are looking like they'll be really valuable and kind of at the center of cryptocurrencies. And so I think uh, as much as I still like Bitcoin, that if it doesn't evolve or there's not good layer twos built on top of Bitcoin, that it could you know, lose its number one spot. I think it'll you know, be in the top 10 for decades to come. But uh, you know, I think we could see something like Ethereum flipping with it for sure. Uh, one of the main things um, that's sort of bad press about Bitcoin that you hear out there is this, um, the power that it takes. Is that, could, could you expand a little bit more on if you're concerned about that, if you think that's problematic? I haven't dived too deeply. I think, you know, definitely looking out for the world we live in and making sure we kind of don't harm it unnecessarily is important. But it kind of was the best option when it was uh, developed. It was kind of the, the first way that we could create this decentralized cash. It was necessary for uh, something called proof of work and that required um, you know, users called miners to secure this network from, you know, any one person gaining control of it. And the way to do that was to run specialized hardware that uses electricity, but it can't be faked. And that's actually what gives Bitcoin its security. You know, Ethereum and, and a lot of the new chains, they're starting to prove, you know, play with something called proof of stake, which uh, doesn't re- have that, you know, hardware requirement that's using electricity, but there's trade-offs. And so, you know, I think eventually we'll find kind of the right balance. And that could mean that Bitcoin is unseated as the number one and potentially, you know, maybe decades in the future goes away completely. But I think it was kind of a necessary step. And now we're working out kind of how to fix it. That's awesome, Tyler. Yeah, I think that's one of the better and more concise explanations of the proof of work, proof of stake. So I appreciate you giving that to our audience. That's awesome. So, uh, Tyler, Jonathan, as you probably have heard many, many times, uh, describes you as one of the most, if not the most successful investors that he knows. I think there is a misconception out there that, you know, if you're a successful business operator and and you've made money running your own business, operating your own business, that you can go into the investments world and duplicate that success and automatically be able to you know, have success uh, as an investor. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I do think they're kind of, there's some overlap, but they're also very different skill sets. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, uh, do you see some overlap there? Do you think that, do you agree with, with uh, uh, folks that say that it, it is kind of two different uh, skill sets? I think they're pretty different skill sets, maybe even opposite in a way from each other. You know, we touched on it a little bit, that I, you know, and a lot of advice that I give to people that have their own ideas is to be prepared to kind of iterate quickly and not to be too in love with your own idea. You know, I think anyone listening to this podcast, if you have kind of an entrepreneurial mindset, you're, you've probably had that experience where you have an idea and it's like, this idea is amazing. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to build it. And you can kind of take that too far and, basically be convince yourself that this idea is going to work even when you start getting feedback from the market that it doesn't look like a good fit. And so being willing to move quickly from one idea to the next and not be too sold on even your own ideas um, as, as an entrepreneur, I think it's very important. On the other hand, for an investor, I think it's kind of the opposite. You don't want to be constantly changing your ideas and your strategy. I think you want to look at what do you like, whether it's a company on, you know, in the stock market or a, a cryptocurrency or a, a DeFi token? And you need to kind of do your own research and look at a long term plan. Do I think this is going to be, you know, around in 10 years? Um, you know, what's its source of revenue and growth and return? And once you kind of make that decision, hey, I'm going to invest in Bitcoin or Ethereum or Google or Facebook, that you kind of stick with that decision and you you let that investment ride because it you know if you follow market news you're you're just going to turn into a day trader cuz you know every every few days or weeks you know things are looking great things are looking terrible and if you listen to that you're you're just going to be in and out of positions and probably making making bad trades so i'd say on the entrepreneurial side 
you know, you actually want to keep an open mind, look at market feedback to your, your ideas and change quickly on the investor side, you know, be a little bit slower and uh, really have good reasoning um, and think through it before, you know, changing your, your investment plan. That makes sense. I also would, would say um, you do want to take into account new information that you're getting with your investment positions though. Would, would you agree? And uh, so based on new information, you know, it might make sense to make some adjustments to your holdings and your, your long-term investment plan. How, how would you, how do you think about that? How would you factor in as you're hold, you know, you're buying an investment for the long term, and, you know, you get some new information that kind of maybe changes the landscape a little bit or, or a lot potentially. And, um, you know, how, how are you uh, digesting that new information and then, um, you know, using that new information to adjust your, your positions? Yeah, I guess I would say I probably try to look and see if that new information is really changing my investment plan for what I'm currently invested in. So, you know, let's say I own real estate in some city and something comes out that says, you know, the new hot city is actually across the country. Um, you know, it could be tempting to say, well, let me sell, sell that rental and hurry and buy in the new hot city. And it's like, well, that news didn't really say the current city I had chosen for, you know, a variety of reasons that I thought would do well is doing poorly. Um, it's just saying there could be a better opportunity somewhere else. And I think it's those changing costs and, and jumping around versus an article that says, hey, you know, five of the top 10 employers of the city where I'm investing, you know, are closing up shop. And, you know, that's really going to change the demographics of that area. And that's going to, you know, that's going to be information specifically about kind of my investment plan for that, that particular area that maybe I should say, I, you know, let's get out of that and, and, and put that capital somewhere else. And so same thing with, you know, crypto or stocks, it's kind of, Hey, this company or this, this coin is, uh, is the new hot thing. And it's like, well, I don't think that, um, necessarily is going to change how I feel about, uh, the, the, you know, investments I've already made. Right. Um, and so that's kind of something I, I, I try to look at. How do you think about diversification within your portfolio? So obviously you invest in crypto, you invest in real estate, uh, sounds like you invest in some stocks. How do you, what's your strategy in terms of uh, weighting each of those uh, investment vehicles and, and diversifying within the portfolio? Yeah, I think diversification is uh, super important and overlooked. Again, that can be kind of, I think, the way the market news works of here's the hot stock or the hot, hot cryptocurrency, you know, you want to go all in on one thing. But I think trying to keep a balanced approach right now, I, I roughly like to just kind of do equal parts, real estate, crypto and, uh, you know, stock market or, or, you know, company ownership. And so, you know, I think you look through the trends over the decades and, you know, it's, you know, one five or 10 year period can be dominated by bonds or the stock market. You know, we've just had a crazy decade in crypto. And I think what they found is usually whatever's been the hot, you know, commodity of the decade usually is not the number one commodity for, you know, a following decade. And so as much as you, you kind of want to stay, stay and jump into what's hot that uh, usually it's hard to kind of guess that ahead of time. And so being diversified, you know, can actually keep you in, in what's going to do the best, um, you know, kind of unexpectedly for the markets and, and it's, you know, just reducing your risk. And I think being risk balanced is, is important. What would you say to the young investors out there? So we got many folks who, you know, may not be as financially established yet, uh, but they want to start investing. They want to start putting some money to work. They want to start learning, you know, uh, what, what would you say to those folks and uh, what advice would you give to someone who's starting with kind of a lower balance in their trading account, let's say? Yeah, I think there's, you know, a lot of things as you get into it, just good advice, like, you know, make sure you have a reserve in cash, you know, don't invest everything, don't invest your savings account, you know, if you put it all into crypto and it goes down and that was your rent money, you know, that's going to make life difficult. And so, you know, there are some basics and there's a lot of blogs and stuff that cover that, um, you know, make sure you you kind of have cash reserves and, and, you know, there's some other general advice out there before you you dive in. And then I think we touched on it, you know, diversify, don't go all in on stocks or all in on crypto and then just learn as much as you can. But I think there's, you know, good books like uh, there's one called Boggleheads Guide to Investing and, 
you know, it's just a lot of times the most boring approach um, tends to be the best approach, index funds and things that don't take a lot of work and a lot of effort. And they're going to keep you from bouncing between different types of investments because everything's just kind of one in one one pool anyways. So. So what I'm getting from what uh, your advice is, you're telling everyone to put all their money into Dogecoin. Is that Absolutely. what I'm getting so far? Go full Doge. <laughs> full Doge. <laughs> My recommendation. After starting all these companies, you know, 10 plus companies or whatever it is at this point, what is the advice that you would give uh, people looking, whether they're in college, out of college, or they've been in a career for, you know, 10 years and they just wanting to go do something on their own? What are some of the things you think are most important to tell them? I mean, yeah, as much as you can, finding something that just really interests you and you can, you know, do a deep dive in, you know, I think that just was something that worked out well for me and was kind of, I mean, uh, just a kind of fortunate uh, series of events. But I think, um, you know, whether, you know, it's Doug and he's in college and it's like, hey, what, what interests me most or what could I do and become the best at, you know, that could be painting, that can be, you know, a lot of, you know, just kind of everyday types of jobs. And I think that's completely okay to do things outside of tech. Um, even with my tech background, you know, I kind of applied that to uh, dietary supplements, but, you know, it's not really a tech company per se. And so find what interests you, learn as much as you can. And, uh, you know, like you said, if you, if you can do something you love, you know, it's, it's not going to feel nearly as much like work. Awesome. Uh, you've had a bunch of different partnerships at this point in your career now. Also, I was curious to hear what your take was on some of the, what are the reasons some of the partnerships have worked out well, like with yours truly. Um, and then some of the partnerships that didn't work out as well. Do you have any, uh, learnings from that? I mean, I, I wouldn't say I had too many that worked out poorly, um, or, you know, too, too poorly, but, you know, I think, just people you get along with. A lot of them have been friends. And so it's, you know, it's already people that uh, you're, you know, that you have common interests with. And so again, I think that's kind of building that network of people to pull with and partner with and in college being such a big benefit. And so I, I can't speak too much to having to go out and find a partner and someone, you know, you don't really know. And, and I think there could be a lot of challenges there. But it, it still seems like every every partnership has its challenges and its ups and downs. And, you know, just accepting that all people kind of have different approaches and that your approach is not necessarily any better. And to kind of let each partner, you know, do things the way they see fit in kind of their area and, and trusting them, um, you know, is the best approach. So you've mentioned, uh, Tyler, your dad as being one of your early influences in, in the world of entrepreneurship and, and being in business for yourself. Are there any other uh, people that come to mind for you that uh, kind of showed you the way or were uh, uh, an influence or a mentor for you coming up? Yeah, I'd actually say Travis. You know, he started selling things at school, you know, buying bags of candy and reselling it to friends and uh, just all sorts of things. And so I think kind of the example of my dad, but then seeing Travis as, you know, kind of someone my age, my older, my older brother that was kind of directly doing that and making money just reinforced, uh, you know, this idea of find an idea, you know, try it out, you know, maybe you bought that bag of candy and no one bought it, but, you know, Travis figured something else he could try to try to sell people at, you know, at school. So he was always doing his own thing. Um, and then the yeah, other influential, I mean, I feel like I never really had too many influencers or mentors that I kind of looked up to, but my parents did buy like the whole Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad series when I was in high school. I remember that being kind of influential and how I, how I thought of money and, and building passive income. And then also when I was at college, right before starting Supergenics, I had recently read uh, Tim Ferriss's four day, uh, four hour work week. Um, and, you know, kind of modeled a lot of, um, starting my company around some of his advice. And I I feel like that was really helpful to, to kind of get in the mindset of how to grow to the company, how to remove yourself as kind of a point of friction and and let the company grow faster than it would if you kind of kept yourself in the middle of everything. And so, yeah, those are, you know, the, the examples that come to mind. 
Yeah, I think just hearing you say that remove yourself as a as a front of, fr- of friction is so critical. I think a lot of probably the most comment that I get when I'm hanging out with people is, you know, how is how are you able to run the companies without being there? Are you worried about things that are happening when you're not as involved as you used to be? I think it's really important that people understand hiring and training good people and building. This is another good thing that you, that you guys taught me is really building that infrastructure building those standard operating procedures and then having the good people that you trust um, really run all the things so that you're not a bottleneck on anything. I think that that's right. super yeah, exactly. I think if you stay too much in, you know, the day-to-day problems, which is very easy to do as, you know, a founder, you just don't have the free time, the, the time you need to look at the bigger picture items, you know, be working on plans on growth and, new opportunities because you're just, you get too stuck in, uh, in, in the day-to-day problems, which are, are endless in running your own business. Yeah. I was curious. Um, you brought up Robert Kiyosaki. What is it? Is there any specific things that come to mind that you felt were really important in those books? Um, I can't remember too many specifics. I just remember, you know, at the time in high school, just at that age, it just feeling like kind of an aha moment of, I've never thought of, money or I probably hadn't spent any time thinking about money and investing and, you know, what that looks like, you know, it's just, you go to school, you get a job. And that was kind of the first bigger picture of, Hey, you can buy things that, you know, use your capital or you can invest in things that will give you new passive capital that can eventually be enough to, you know, live off of. And that was just kind of, I think then tied in with my dad being an entrepreneur and what, what he had done. And it just kind of was one of the the stepping stones and kind of developing my thought process for kind of how I had, you know, the vision that I had for, for my life. That's awesome. Uh, what are your goals for the next few years? Is there any projects you're currently excited about or is there things you're looking out uh, in the future for? Yeah, I think I just, you know, love being part of, like I've, I've said a few times, the early stages of projects and especially in programming are just, it's super fun to take on a new a new project, try to figure out the you know kind of the best way to to set that project up and and that those you know first couple of weeks of programming and so I think just you know finding the next project that I can really get engaged with and 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 kind of love the the experience of uh, of building it out. Aside from uh, gaining a lot of experience and knowledge as a an entrepreneur over over your now long career of what, 20, 20 years. Um, how, how would you say your outlook and or your worldview has evolved over the years? I know that's a kind of an esoteric, um, broad question, but please feel free to answer it in any, any way. Uh, yeah. I mean, recently I've, I've just found myself kind of thinking of, uh, you know, just how, how short life is. Um, you know, my, my father passed away two years ago, It seemed like a lot of his life plan was run the business until retirement. And then, you know, then that's kind of when you looked at, you know, slowing down and, you know, doing more for yourself. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, he he passed away before before reaching that point. And so I think uh, just especially with young kids, just finding that and maybe balance is even the right word with family, but just spending the quality time consistently with my family, my kids, my friends, and kind of building the more meaningful things in life that, you know, it seems like the days and weeks can just kind of fly by if you don't consciously sit down and say, Hey, I want to do something meaningful with my kids, with my friends, and let's schedule that like a business meeting and make it happen because otherwise those things seem to kind of get missed and, it, you know, it's like, oh, you know, another whole year has passed. Here we are in November. And, you know, what did I really do in terms of those relationships that matter most? What a great point. Yeah, I feel like a lot of times we plug the work stuff into our calendar because we got to make sure we have our to-do list. And at the end of the day, we've hit all of our stuff for the business, for work. But I think one of the things I just took from what you said is you got to also plug the the family stuff into the calendar, the recreational stuff into the calendar and treat it the same way. Cause it's yeah. equally as important, if not more important to make the time for that. And right. if we're not putting it into the calendar, you know, like you said, a, a day goes by, a week goes by, a month goes by, you look up and you didn't make the time as much time for those things uh, that should be high priorities in, in your life. So. Right. Yeah. We get things on our schedule, like, uh, 
you know, a work meeting or a work dinner, a work trip. And, you know, we never miss those. But, you know, why do we, you know, reschedule our, you know, kind of our personal commitments so much easier and kind of feel like those are less important when, you know, those should probably be the, you know, sorry, I can't, can't do that meeting or, you know, stay late for work. I've, you know, I've got something more important planned. Yeah. One of the early points of friction with, uh, with Tyler and I early in our partnership was these, uh, these, uh, uh, formal meetings and, uh, <laughs> discussions, uh, because Tyler, I think one of the things he learned from his early years in the corporate life is that most meetings were worthless or not productive. <laughs> and then I came in from my hospitality background, um, say like, all right, we need to sit together. We all need to talk about these things. Um, we need to have formal meeting notes on everything. And I remember Tyler always just being like, I'm going to go work on this. I have my stuff I'm working on. Travis sort of knows what he's working on. You think you know what you're working on. Like, just go do your stuff. And then like, when we have stuff that comes up, we can talk about it. But I remember him just being such a hater, (laughs) a hater on me. Like, all right, guys, let's get our meeting together. Why are you late to the meeting? (laughs) One of the other things um, from what you just spoke about, Tyler, that I also really love is, um, you know, once you do become a little bit more financially free, Um, I think one of the lessons you taught me was that you should be spending your money on things, um, that give you real value, you know, really find this places in your life that you can spend on that give you value. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. And I mean, I think that was, uh, you know, a point that Tim Ferriss brought up and four hour work week where he kind of says, you know, what's your vision? What's the point of making the money? And actually write that down and look at how much, you know, that's going to cost to have that lifestyle or that experience or that car. And, you know, his point was a lot of times it's not as much as you would think. And, you know, if you have that specific goal in mind, you know, Hey, how many, you know, sales of this product do I really need? And can I build a, a, you know, a company just to that size, but no bigger that I'm going to now start being, you know, more busy with work and kind of detract from that, that original vision. And so I think a lot of times, you know, when you sit down and kind of write down, Hey, what do I want? You know, the material things end up being a lot less important versus the experiences with people. And I think trying to create those moments with friends and family are, are going to be something that you remember, you know, much longer than, you know, the latest, the latest gadget you could buy. And so, uh, you know, I've tried to focus with uh, me and my wife and our family to, you know, use our, our money to build those experiences. I love that. That's super awesome. It sounds like you got your priorities straight, my man. Love it. It's always, it's still, still a balance, you know, times where we, if we do better or worse. And so, you know, I think like everything, it's just kind of a iterative process of, you know, you lose focus and then you, you know, you kind of, bring your focus back to that area and and then try again, you know, to, to do a little bit better. Yeah. Another thing that I've sort of learned from you from just watching is, um, I feel like a lot of our successful friends have continued chasing, um, sort of keep elevating the number, their goal number that they're trying to reach. And it's kind of taking away from those things that you keep referring to is like, where you really derive the value from the time with kids, time with friends, time with family. Instead, they're like, all right, well, I hit my 5 million goal. Like I need to hit that 10 million, 50 million, 100 million goal. So I think it's really important to, to, for people to really think about what is your goal. And then as you're approaching it, you know, is the, is the freedom of time really of importance to you? And where does that rank on your, um, on your scale in your life as a priority? So, so I really admire that about you is you've really, you know, you've, you've worked towards a goal, and now I see you spending massive time with your children, massive time with your wife, and, and you're very involved with all your family. Um, so I love that you really kind of have, have, you know, gotten to a place in your life where you have this freedom and every morning you wake up and you do the things that you want to do. And I think that's what a lot of people are shooting for to find their freedom. Yeah. And, and I think that is a hard trade off when it's like, hey, I think if I put more hours in, I could grow this company bigger than it is today, but kind of setting that metric early on and, and kind of knowing when enough's enough and having those other, other priorities and goals in life and and kind of knowing when to switch, switch focus. That's awesome. Yeah. Our goal with the find your freedom podcast is to provide inspirational stories from interesting people 
and also give a lot of tidbits of knowledge to entrepreneurs who are currently struggling or people looking to get to the next level. And I think this podcast has completely succeeded with that. So we're super grateful to you, Tyler. Yeah, thanks for having me. Tyler, thank you so much for coming on, man. It's good to learn a little bit more about you here. We've known each other for a long time, but I uh, learned some new things today. And um, I'm even more impressed with how you um, how you organize your life. So keep yeah, doing what you're you doing. Much. And um, thanks again for the time. Thanks, guys.